Southwest Missouri State University Department of Geography Geology presents Land and Life in the Ozarks. This course is one of several units of study offered in Ozark Regional Studies at SMSU and is designed to enhance appreciation of the cultural heritage of this region. The lecture today will deal with the geography of mining districts in the Ozarks. I'll be talking about the major areas where mining has gone on in the past and also about some of the new mining districts that are operating today. Uh, the emphasis will be on the location of those uh, mining areas, on the uh, occurrence of the ores, that is the geologic occurrence of the ores, and then some of the landscape uh, imprint that it was left by the mining activities. I think uh, I'd like to begin by looking at a map of the mineral uh, districts of the Ozarks. Uh, this map also is uh, found in your text, but uh, this will help us, I think, to organize where we're at, and then we'll talk about some of the mining districts. So if we could look at this map, uh, I'd like, first of all, to talk about, I'll be talking first about lead. Uh, lead mining has always been the most important uh, mining activity in the Ozarks. We've already talked about the old lead belt in St. Francis, Madison, and Washington counties. Uh, this was opened up, of course, at a very early date, around 1700, and uh, operated for more than 200 years. In the 1840s, the central lead mining district was opened up south and west of Jefferson City in the Osage Gasconade Hills. This mining area was, consisted of a number of mines, but most of them small, and uh, in fact, the uh, Missouri Geological Survey estimates that only a little over 15,000 tons of lead were produced in over 100 years of operation. A very important mining district was the one in uh, southwest Missouri, uh, southeast Kansas, and northeastern Oklahoma, known as the Tri-State District. Ores were discovered at Joplin in 1848. Mining was opened up in 1850 at Granby. And although uh, zinc uh, was known from the very first, uh, the zinc ore was thrown away until 1873 when uh, techniques for smelting were uh, discovered. By 18, uh, the 18, mid 1880s, it was the most important metal mine in this uh, district. In North Arkansas, there is a lead zinc district there too, uh, much like the central district in the northern o uh, Ozarks. Uh, the production was never very important compared to the old lead belt and the tri-state district. Uh, these counties in North Arkansas include Boone and Marion, Carroll, uh, and Newton counties, and some of the uh, portions of the adjacent counties. Uh, the last mining here was in about 1967. The most recent and most important mining district that is in the Ozarks uh, today is the new lead belt in Iron and Reynolds County. Uh, this district was opened in 1950, or discovered in 1955 and opened during the 1960s. So uh, th uh, this is now the world's largest mining, uh, lead mining district uh, as far as production is concerned. I'd like uh, to talk then uh, specifically about some of these mining districts and uh, show you a number of interesting, what I think will be interesting pictures of early mining activities and also current mining activities. The <clears throat> Old Lead Belt, of course, was opened by the French around 1700, but really uh, they were mining uh, rather shallow deposits of lead, and uh, important uh, immigration to the area really didn't begin until after uh, the deeper deposits were discovered and uh, work began in mining those uh, deeper deposits. If I could have the first slide then, uh, we see an early picture of Potosi, probably around 1820. Uh, Potosi in Washington County uh, consisted then of just a cluster of houses uh, set amongst the uh, uh, lead mines. In the next picture, we see a diamond drill. This is one of the first diamond drills in operation. The diamond drill was extremely important. Uh, it was introduced in 1869 by St. Joe Lead Company, or St. Joseph Lead Company. It made exploration in the Bon Terre Formation possible. Uh, the lead occurred in runs or sheets, and uh, it was impossible to discover these until uh, the diamond drill uh, came on the scene. Uh, very soon, uh, 
uh, large underground workings appeared. And in the next picture, we see uh, one of these uh, big uh, underground mines. Uh, these mines were, uh, uh, this mining went on for uh, more than 100 years. In fact, the last mine closed in 1973. And the whole region of the old lead belt is simply honeycombed with these uh, mines, uh, some of them uh, with ceilings that go up to 70 feet in height. In the next picture, we see another uh, uh, picture of an early mining town. This is uh, Bon Terre around, uh, around 1875. And already it was a smoky, milling, and smelting town. In the next slide, we see uh, the smelter built by St. Joe Lead at Herculaneum in 1893. Uh, after this, most of the smelting was concentrated at Herculaneum. And there was a gradual consolidation of the companies and St. Joe took over much of the smelting activity. In the next picture, we see the men, in, uh, much of the labor even in 1893 was done by hand. Here the men are charging those furnaces uh, with using wheelbarrows. In the next picture, we see them handling lead by hand, loading it into uh, railroad cars for shipment out. Uh, St. Joe Lead and many of the other lead companies that were operating uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, were uh, paternalistic companies in that uh, they uh, many created towns that were essentially company towns and many of the businesses were owned by the companies themselves. In the next picture, we see a company store that was operated by St. Joe Lead in Herculaneum around 1908. Uh, in the next slide, we see a view of uh, St. Uh, Francis County, uh, and around each of the strikes, a town grew up. I've circled more than 20 towns that grew up in St. Francis County around the lead mines, or you can see those marked on the map. Uh, they were connected by uh, interurban railroads, but uh, even today, the towns still exist. Uh, some of them are consolidating some of their services because they are so close together. It's sort of a dispersed, agglomerated pattern of settlement. Of course, many of these towns have had a boom and bust economy. Uh, today, in, in, in the next slide, if we can have it, we see the traces of mining in the old lead belt uh, remain in the form of abandoned buildings, mine dumps, uh, sediment ponds, and haul paths. Uh, recently, St. Joe Lead has uh, reworked some of this land as a residential development, and uh, most recently, they've given 8,500 acres to the state of Missouri as a park. Now, uh, I'd like to turn next to the new lead belt, or Viburnum Trend, as it's known. Uh, this mine or district was opened in 1955, or discovered in 1955, and the first exploratory mines were opened up in the 1960s. Since then, more than nine uh, mines have uh, been opened. If we could have the next slide, we can see a map that shows the relationship of the new lead belt to the old lead belt. Here we see that the new lead belt is on the west side of the St. Francis Mountains. Uh, and in fact, they are mining essentially the same deposits, except that they're on the west side of the St. Francis Mountains. Geologists believe that the lead ores here <coughs> really were uh, deposited in an old reef, uh, which was formed when all of the region except the mountains were, were, uh, was submerged during Cambrian times. If we can turn next to a poster, uh, which I've drawn, I hope this will uh, explain a little bit of the geology or the occurrence of the ores there. This represents the uh, St. Francis Mountains, the outcrop of igneous rocks. Uh, this black line here represents a barrier reef that surrounded the St. Francis Mountains during uh, the Cambrian time when the area was submerged. The ores are associated, not all of the ores, but many of the ores are associated with those reef deposits. The lead was not deposited at the time the reef was formed, but at a later time when perhaps the chemistry might have been uh, just right. But the old lead belt was associated, or at least many of the mines were associated with that lead, or the reef. And over in the new lead belt, most all of the mines are strung out along the so-called Viburnum trend. Viburnum was the initial mine. 
and they are, these mines are associated with that reef. In the cross section, if we can come up uh, to the diagram in, at the top, uh, here we see marked in red is the reef buried in the Bonterre limestone. Now, and drop that, let's see if we can get it back up. Uh, if we look at the, uh, these are the, this represents the St. Francis Mountains, and then over here we see the same reef outcropping on the west also buried in the Bonterre, Bonterre Formation. And it's in this deposit that they're mining today in the new lead belt. Well, I hope that uh, little accident uh, didn't spoil it for you, but I, you, uh, I think you can understand the basic uh, geologic relationships there from the um, uh, diagram. If we can have the next slide then, uh, we see an example of the ore that is taken from the Viburnum mine or, and from the mines in the Viburnum Trend. It's a disseminated lead shot through the uh, dolomite. As the dolomite was uh, removed by solution, the lead was deposited in its place. We'll look at several uh, examples here that will explain the most recent mining now very quickly. In the next slide, we see a uh, schematic of the mining operations there. If you just look at the top half of your screen, the bottom half is simply a flow diagram of the milling process. But you can see that the mine is worked at se the mines are worked at several levels. Uh, the ore is mined, dumped into a uh, shaft, and then hoisted to the surface where it is milled and then later smelted. In the next picture, we see some of the underground workings. In this case, it's uh, a machine shop in the Ozark Lead Company in Reynolds County. Uh, here, all the machinery is serviced. It's uh, all the haulage machinery is uh, rubber tired equipment uh, powered by diesel. In the next picture, we see the hoist house. In this case, it's a maintenance shaft. A similar shaft is used to hoist the ores to the surface. In the next slide, we see some of the milling equipment. It is thoroughly a modern plant. None of the plants, of course, are any older than uh, the early 1960s. Here, the um, ore is crushed into a very fine powder. In the next slide, we see a group of uh, our students passing through a part of the um, flotation cells where the lead and zinc are floated off. It seems rather um, uh, unusual that lead would float, but it is a chemical process where the lead is floated to the surface on bubbles. And then uh, it is, they are able to recover it then. In the next picture, we see where the tailings or the unwanted part of the material that is mined are, is pumped to a nearby branch uh, stream branch, and then the tailings is, are used to build a dam for a uh, tailings pond. In the next picture, we see the tailings pond. The finer material goes into the tailings pond and is allowed to settle out. The water, of course, goes on down into the streams in the vicinity. And in the next picture, we see an unusual uh, man-made meander loop, uh, which the mining company has uh, built there in order to allow uh, algae to work on the uh, nutrients in the water uh, before they uh, are emptied into the main stream. In other words, the company has lengthened the uh, stream on their own property. Incidentally, these ores that are mined here, many of the ores are mined on government property, and it is a sizable income to the government. Uh, in the next slide then. We uh, look at the smelter at Buick. There's a smelter at Glover and also at Herculaneum. And in the next picture we see the actual smelting process. Copper and silver are obtained from the lead ore uh, as byproduct materials. The zinc goes out of the Ozarks uh, to be smelted. Some of it in St. Louis, some of it in Europe. In the next picture we see uh, the pig, pig, uh, pigs of lead being formed or in this case being loaded and ready for shipment. In the next slide, we see the initial mine in the area, the Viburnum mine of St. Joe Lead. It was the discovery mine located uh, at Viburnum, Missouri. And the town of Viburnum has grown into a new town with a new high school, a new airport, a new, new residential districts, and a new business district. And here we see uh, the Viburnum Inn and the supermarket. And in the next slide, we see uh, the new headquarters of uh, St. Joe Mineral uh, or St. Joe Lead Company 
uh, which has been recently moved from Bonterre to this location. Uh, Viburnum is really the only uh, large town, or, or excuse me, not large town, but new town that's been formed in the Ozarks since, uh, uh, well, in the last hundred years with uh, the possible exception of the towns uh, that have been formed around some of the lakes. Uh, very few towns have been formed since uh, the railroad era in the Ozarks. Next, I'd like to look at the Tri-State District. And uh, the Tri-State District, uh, if we can, uh, the, the ores there occur in Mississippian limestone. And uh, they occur as either masses of ore or as sheet deposits, uh, just as they do in the, in the eastern Ozarks. Uh, if we could have the first slide, then. Uh, here we see a part of the Granby uh, topographic sheet with literally hundreds of shafts uh, exposed on this uh, one sheet. Uh, the mines were shallow, they were, they were easily worked, and Granby was known as a poor man's camp because it didn't take much equipment to get into the mining business. The same was true of Aurora and the Springfield diggings and many other diggings in the uh, tri-state district. In the next picture we see a hand windlass which was used to hoist the ore to the surface in the early days. Uh, if we can look at the next picture then we see um, in this, this is a mine called the Jack Sprout Mine uh, that was operating uh, in the late uh, 1800s in the Granby area. It used a horse hoist, uh, a, a simple beam pump was used to clear the mine of water and the uh, lead was separated from the uh, gang material by a uh, hand jig. Gradually as the mines became larger, uh, steam power was used. Uh, gradually there was a consolidation. As the mines got deeper and more capital was required, uh, they consolidated and, uh, and uh, uh, the mining operations uh, b got larger. Uh, St. Joe Lead, Eagle Pitcher, and uh, in the next picture, if we can have it, we see an example of one of the earliest of the consolidated mining operations, the Granby Mining and Smelting Company. Uh, this picture was taken around the turn of the century uh, at Granby. There are still remnants of these old operations in Granby. And in the next picture, we see uh, an example of this. The house was part of the office building, and the buildings at the left represent part of the old mill works. Uh, one of the most uh, lucrative strikes in the, the tri-state district we see in the next picture. Uh, this is uh, part of the pit at Orinogo from which $30 million uh, worth of lead was dug. And there are many, many uh, remnants or uh, vestiges of uh, the mining activity that tell us that mining was extremely important to the uh, region in, south, in the southwestern Ozarks, uh, known as the Tri-State District. There are huge chat piles. Uh, there are old uh, mill foundations. Uh, in this picture here, we see um, part of a uh, shaft uh, that's wooded in. In the next picture, we uh, see a shaft in which the timbers have, have uh, rotted out. These present something of a hazard. Uh, un unfortunately, the ownership of the property has changed hands several times, and uh, it's very difficult to trace down just who is responsible for taking care of an uh, environmental problem such as this. In the next picture, uh, we see how the men were transported down into the mines in the, in the tri-state district. Actually, in the latter sta stages of its operation, uh, the mining was uh, fairly crude, or at least equipment compared to the uh, new equipment that is found in the new lead belt. Uh, in the next picture, we see one of the chat piles, this one near Orinogo. Most of the large chat piles near the mills have been hauled away to be used as building material and road surfacing material. Uh, some of those in Oklahoma are still there to be hauled away, and they are busy hauling them away. In the next picture, we see one of the th things that occasionally happens, that is a cave-in, where too much of the material, that is the lead, the ore material was removed, and uh, cave-ins do occur in Joplin and in that general vicinity. Uh, just as in the old lead belt, each mining district, uh, or each mine that was opened, uh, usually brought an establishment of a mining camp, and in the next uh, slide, we see a portion of the, or a, vis a section of a map uh, near Joplin, and I have circled on this map uh, uh, nearly 30 small towns that are named, uh, still named on this map. 
Uh, at one time, there was an extensive uh, uh, interurban railroad built between all of these, or most of these small towns. It extended into Miami, Oklahoma, and to Pittsburgh, Kansas, to Columbus, Kansas as well, also to Carthage. Next, I'd like to look at iron mining. We've already talked about uh, iron mining as an important uh, factor in the settlement of the interior Ozarks, particularly with the founding of the Ashabran furnace on Stout Creek and the Springfield furnace in southern Washington County. Uh, I have uh, uh, some interesting pictures of some of the early day mines. And if we could have the first slide, this is a picture of a Sligo furnace in eastern Dent County. Uh, this uh, furnace, I was surprised to see that it was this large. I knew that it did operate up until the 1930s, and it was fueled by charcoal. It, it, we see in the next picture some of the charcoal ovens at the, the Sligo furnace, and if you can see, you can see from the size of these furnaces or ovens that it was a large operation. They used the charcoal to fuel the furnaces and also to reduce the ore uh, to metal. But it, uh, really, thousands of acres of uh, timber were cleared in order to uh, provide uh, timber or fuel for the iron furnaces. And as you recall, there, was, there e were even railroads built out to uh, bring that uh, timber into the furnaces. Uh, if we could see the next slide, yes, this one here is uh, a mine, one of the iron uh, sink fill mines. That is, the iron was deposited in old sinkholes. This one is a mine in Wayne County. Uh, then if we can see the next picture, uh, this is uh, one of the larger of these sink fill deposits. This is uh, uh, the uh, uh, Cherry Valley mine, which is in Dent County. It's a tremendous sinkhole that was filled with uh, iron, and then that provided uh, the source of the mining activity there. In the next picture, we see a, a washing uh, apparatus where the, mine, where the ores were washed. Uh, this one in Carter County. Uh, the mines were widely dispersed in the Curtois Hills and in the Salem Plateau. Uh, in the next slide, if we could look at it, we see a map of um, Wayne County, and each dot on this map represents one of the sink fill mines. Uh, the most recent mines, uh, and if we could uh, turn back to our map now uh, for just a moment, I'd like to point out uh, where these iron mines are. The, uh, the sink fill mines are here, uh, and then also here in the southern, uh, southeastern section of the Ozarks, in the Missouri Ozarks. Uh, the more productive mines today, the only mines that are of any import importance today are the ones in the St. Francis Mountains, the one here at uh, Pilot Knob, and also the Pea Ridge Mine, uh, which is to the north of the St. Francis Mountains. If we could have the next slide then, we see an example uh, or a picture of Pilot Knob uh, as it exists today, the, the north half of the mountain, you're looking east, the north half of the mountain was mined away many years ago. The new mines are located at the base of the mountain, and they are large uh, uh, operations. It's by the, the Hanna uh, Mining and Milling Company. In the next picture, we see a cross-section of that mountain, looking, also looking east in this case, and the ores were mined at the top in the early day, and then today they're mining those deposits that show up dark at the left uh, part of the uh, map. Uh, then if we could look at the next map, or next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, some of the operations of the, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, or the actual diggings around the turn of the century at the uh, mine uh, at Pilot, at Pilot Knob. At the, if could you could look at the next slide, please. Uh, this is a uh, picture of some of the magnetite ore that is uh, uh, raised at the, at the Pea Ridge mine. Uh, this ore is hoisted from the Precambrian rocks uh, some 900 feet to the surface. And uh, it's operated by St. Joe Lead in cooperation with Bethlehem Steel. In the next picture, we see uh, cars, railroad cars, loaded with uh, pellets. The ore is uh, is uh, milled and then fabricated into pellets for shipment uh, out. It's shipped to a lot of places. Uh, um, the bulk of it goes to the Granite City Steel Company in Granite City, Illinois, across the river from uh, the city of St. Louis. Uh, 
barite then. I'd like to turn back to our map then uh, for a moment and point out uh, the location of barite mining in, in the uh, uh, Ozarks. Barite is mined in Washington County uh, primarily, and this is the largest mining district in, in the United States as far as barite is concerned. Barite also uh, used to be mined in the Osage Gasconade Hills and along the northern Ozark border. But this mining now has passed from the scene. We're look, if we can look at the next slide, we see an example of barite. It is a uh, white uh, to gray looking me uh, mineral, uh, rather heavy. Mining of this mineral uh, <coughs> began around 1850. And then it was, it was used primarily as a filler in paints. Uh, the, around 1925, uh, barite began to be used as a, uh, for driller's mud, that is to seal off uh, gas pressure in oil wells. And this, since that time, uh, the, the demand for this commodity has uh, been very strong. In the next picture, we see some of the modern day operations. It is a shallow um, mining operation. For a long time, the French dug this in the what was known as the Tiff Belt. Uh, barite is referred to as Tiff sometimes. In the next picture, we see uh, an aerial view of one of the washing, uh, or near one of the washing plants. There are about 25 or 30 washing plants in Washington County where the clay is washed off the barite on what are known as log rollers before it's processed. And here, the clays are caught in sediment ponds so that uh, it doesn't pollute the, uh, the clay doesn't pollute the streams. Another mineral that is mined in the, the northern Ozarks is fire clay. And if we look at the next picture, we see a fire clay pit. Uh, there's a lot more fire clay uh, mined north of the Missouri River, but here the fire clay is the lighter material. The darker uh, buff colored material above is the loess that is stripped away, and then the fire clay is exposed. This is a sinkhole, again, a sinkhole that has, in this case, been filled with fire clay. The fire clay, of course, is uh, uh, used in the manufacture of brick to line uh, furnaces uh, for fireplaces. Uh, it's also used for roofing tile and terracotta and a great many other uses. Uh, silica sand is mined along the eastern border of the Ozarks. But one of the uh, major manufacturing uh, activities in the Ozarks if, uh, is uh, the manufacture of lime. And if we could look at the map again, we see that uh, the, there are important quarries for limestone all along the Mississippi and Missouri River. And the other major area is in the southwest Missouri section around Springfield. Now, there are many, many places that uh, mining of uh, uh, limestone could occur. But uh, the, the, la the use of uh, fuel in large quantities to manufacture lime prevents uh, mining of uh, the limestone in the interior Ozark for the Ozarks for the manufacture of lime. If we could look at the next slide, then we see uh, a in the right-hand map uh, the gas lines that do not enter the Ozarks, and this means that mining of limestone for lime is just really not very feasible. In the next slide, we see one of the important uh, lime quarries in the vicinity of Saint Genevieve. Uh, it, there are many of these in Southwest Missouri as well. This will conclude then our uh, presentation on the uh, mining and uh, mineral industry of the Ozarks. In the next lecture, I'll be talking about the agriculture of the region. For course information concerning land and life in the Ozarks, Contact Dr. Milton Rafferty, Department Head, Geography, Geology, Southwest Missouri State University, Springfield, Missouri, 65802.